Today's reading is from Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. Before I read, I want to set an image, a stage. Joel is trying hard to get the Israelites to come back to the Lord, to open up their hearts and come back. This is what he has to say. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. So blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, consecrate the assembly, bring together the elders and gather the children, those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the temple porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the people, where is their God? Well, as you can see, today's sermon is all about me. Yep. It's about time, right? Yep. <laughs> There's actually about 12 or 13 Joels in the Old Testament. If you look through there, two or three priests at least, the prophet here, uh, one of David's mighty men named Joel, by the way. But uh, this one's not about me. I know you're relieved. <laughs> Thankfully, it's about this good guy, this other preacher from a long time ago. And we're looking at uh, kind of Joel, and Joel gives us in these chapters here, these brief chapters, a look at the time of early Judah, the southern kingdom. He is contemporary or pretty close to Hosea and Amos. That's why I kind of stuck him where I did. The other two first did him. Kind of contemporary with them. And a time where Israel, we've seen from Hosea and Amos how bad Israel was how they had forsaken God in innumerable ways, how they'd made up their own religion, basically, how they had taken money and all those things. But at the same time, once you start coming down into Judah, just south of them, you see when Joel's day that what was going on was Judah was headed in the same direction. They were looking to themselves, which means anything goes, right? If I make myself the God or the rule, then that's what happens. And he's addressing a situation. What he's going to do, mostly what we remember about Joel is the locust plague, right? That consumes the better part of the book. But what he is doing is taking a natural calamity. Things that could happen and locust plagues were not uncommon in these days where they were. Matter of fact, they still happen there. I saw... Um, a picture, and I had it in my files, and I meant to put it on the board for you, so I just told on myself I didn't do it. But, and I'll never forget the date. It was November 17, 2004, because autumn was 10. That was the 10th birthday. But uh, there was a plague, if you will. There was a horde of locusts that hit uh, Cairo, Egypt, which is old Memphis. This is where the pyramids are. Get our timelines there. And they had a picture of it, and they swarmed in and swarmed out in just a matter of hours. And from the picture, you could barely make out the image of the Great Pyramid of Giza in the background. Give you a little icky, thinking about all those things. You ever seen big locusts like that? I'm talking about yay long, big, and they'll stick to you. They're stickies when you pick one up. Hey, I was a boy, okay? And you pick one up and throw it on somebody and splatter it on somebody, what have you. They get some pretty good stickies. We used to have something we used to call Texas grasshoppers. They were about that long and black. And you pick one up and it latch onto your finger and you just shake it off. You had to whack it on something or what have you. Well, that's what this is. And it covered the area. Now, 
when I see these things coming, and I am uh, Joel here, and God inspires him to give this message, what he's doing is saying, look at all that's going on. He lists four kinds of locusts twice in this book. And I don't know if he's necessarily four different locusts or just the four stages of what these locusts do. Nevertheless, what you have is when they would hit, they take your crops. Which in our day, that would mean they would, it would be the same as going into our grocery stores and taking everything out of it. That's what it would mean. Which means you're without food. Which means other things. Not only that, when they hit it in the bud, you don't even have a chance of a future crop. And Joel takes this and he looks at this and says, Hey, let me use this as an illustration for you. And it was a great one. That if you don't turn from your ways... Come back to the great I am, to Jehovah God. This is nothing compared to what God is going to do to this place. Now I want to take just a moment of something I haven't done before. And I want to stop here. I thought this is a good place to do it as we're looking at early on in both of these kingdoms of Israel and in Judah. And I want to give just a little background on this. You may know this. If you do, you can take a break for a minute. We'll come back in just a little while. But you had the division of Israel early on. Jeroboam and Rehoboam. You have those breaking up back in 1 Kings chapter 12. And you have the, you have the uh, nation of Israel splitting. Ten tribes going north. Samaria was their kingdom. Two tribes staying in Jerusalem in their kingdom. And the Levitical priesthood, the Levites, stayed down there as well. And as you go throughout history, you'll start seeing, you'll see Israel and Judah, Israel and Judah, Israel and Judah. Through the Kings, through Chronicles, you'll see those uh, terms used back and forth referring to two different peoples. Amos and Hosea, we'll look at another one or two later on, and also Judah. So when I speak of Israel and I speak of Judah, I speak of Israel as the northern kingdom, because that's what they were, and Judah as the southern kingdom. Now we're looking at the southern kingdom of Judah, we're looking at 200 years give or take, before they were finally taken away. And I mentioned in our opening sermon, if you'll remember, that often the, the phrase is used, I sent them my prophets rising up early. 200 years is pretty early, isn't it? Don't do the things you're doing. Listen to what God has to say. And when that northern kingdom fell in 722 B.C., we saw that the ungodly kingdom had no good kings fall away and was taken away by Assyria. Assyria is the northern, uh, northern uh, nation from Babylonia, or sometimes you'll see it as Chaldea in the Old Testament. Chaldea refers to the region. Abraham was from Ur of the Chaldees, right? He was a Chaldean, actually. And you see these things take place, and you see that northern kingdom go away. As a matter of fact, shortly after that, thankfully, King Hezekiah was able to fend off that northern kingdom that was trying to take Jerusalem. They went away. But eventually the southern kingdom of Judah fell. And they fell for the same reasons that God's people had been falling for years. They had turned a blind eye and a deaf ear to Jehovah. They had stopped looking at what was going on. And what we're looking at here in Joel today is a very similar thing going on. That what's happening is this. When he points to that plague, when he looks at what's going on. Like I said a moment ago, he's basically saying this ain't nothing guys. If we stay with our head on the ground, with our ears stopped up, and our hearts turned away from God, we're going to see far worse than this, and they did, sadly. But besides that, look at what God is always doing with these prophets. Look at what God is doing. Look at how Joel is always coming down through, and in this instance here, how Joel does it, as the other prophets have done as well, to try to bring them back to God. And you look at these Three summaries of three chapters here with me just for a moment. Let's give an overview of the book. Chapter 1, we have the locust plague. Matter of fact, he says in chapter 1 and verse 2, he asked the question of the old men or the elderly men, have you ever seen anything like this in your life? Tell it to the children. Tell it to the other people around you. Let them know that what we're seeing is great. What we're seeing is devastating. What we're seeing is unreal that's going on with us. Let them know what's happening. Let them know that these things that are happening are as bad as they are. And if you live through a traumatic event like they are, if you live through something like that, it leaves an indelible impression upon our minds, does it not? 
It leaves something that sticks in there. And that's exactly what Joel is trying to do. You know, we still use, the, we still talk about today, well, someone's gone through a tragedy, now would be a good time to try to reinforce the Bible and God's love and those things. Well, then maybe get them to become a Christian, maybe bring them back to the Lord or what have you. And you know why we do that? Because it often works. And that's exactly what the prophet is doing here. Listen, folks, tell people that what they're seeing is awful. Tell people that what they're seeing is bad. It's not God's judgment. It's just going to happen. There's a famine in the land, too. You know why? Because all the crops have just been eaten. They say the roar of locusts coming in is unreal. You wouldn't think a small little... Well, these, these rascals were probably about three to four inches long. Not exactly a small bug, but nevertheless, when they start coming in, it sounds like a war. From the humming and the buzzing coming in. And their wings are flapping. Those little tiny wings on them are flapping. And when you hear that, and you see that coming in, you look up and you see, and quite literally you are in the shade almost from so many coming in in a situation like this. And you know that they're coming in to destroy your crops and there's nothing you can do about it. That's a devastation that's unreal. And that's what Joel's point is. Look, folks, you didn't know this was coming, but you do know God's judgment is coming. You do understand that God's judgment is coming upon you because you fail to live in the same light as He does. That devastation that's coming along in chapter 2, He uses that. I had read for us uh, verses 12 through 17 a moment ago. He uses that illustration to say, look, here's what we need to do. Especially, I love verse 13. kind of sums up the entirety of probably their history in one way or another, of both kingdoms one way or another. Rend or tear your heart not your garments. Tearing of the garments was a form of mourning. It was a sign of mourning. They would often tear their garments. They would throw dust upon their heads. They'd go outside the city gate. They would mourn. They'd wail. They would do all of these things. And that's fine, but it doesn't bring repentance. But if I reach into my heart of hearts, and if I'm God's people, and I'm looking inside myself, and I reach into my heart, and I tear it where it will mend the way God wants it to mend, folks. That's repentance. I can't go out here and pretend I'm offering up worship to God and it's not what God wants. I can't do something over here and somehow slip over here and do something else. God sees it all. What I want to do then is tear my heart. I've seen the devastation. I've seen the heartache. I've watched people starve and many times starve to death. And what about my soul? What about our spiritual soul? I mentioned a moment ago, and there's an illustration used in here as well, of losing your crops. You know what you do? You know what we do when our cupboards get empty? We're out of food. We get the keys, get the wallet. We go to the store, and we stock up. Because after all, we can't go without food, can we? We've got to have it. Some of us might could go a little bit longer than others without food. What do we do when we're out of spiritual food? church what do we do when we're starving for God's word for God's love for an understanding of things that are happening and the joy of heaven and the horrors of hell do we break it out and look at it do we feed our soul bring that nurture and joy back into our lives or do we say I think I can wait a little longer Try that with lunch. I dare you, leave more for me. See? We're not going to do it, right? We're going to eat. And probably eat and eat and eat. Dessert table looks pretty long in there, right? Can we do that with God's book? Can we do that with what God wants us to do? These folks were seeing an, an immense time here. God's heart was broken looking down at them. He saw the devastation, saw the things were going on. But folks, when he gets to chapter 3, people are being judged. Enemies are judged. You're going to be judged. All these things are taking place. But God says, look, I want you to proclaim a fast. It's already here. I want you to rend your heart, not your clothes. I want you to make sure that your spirit, that your soul, that your heart is right. My heart's broken. My heart is broken for you. Do you know heart, God's heart could be broken? His heart wounded? Looking down at his people. One thing we see, church, 
looking through these prophets, just the minor prophets, the major prophets are as well. And one thing we always see of these writing prophets is this. And don't miss this no matter what you do. We focus on the devastation and the need for repentance and all those things. Well, these things are written because they need to be done. But don't miss the fact that the great I Am's arms are wide open waiting for His people to return. And every book we read, He's always reaching out. He's always standing there and He says, wait to return to Me. You know what God does from the beginning until the end of the Bible? And as long as this world stands, as far as I know, He seeks us. You know, when, when the Bible says in Luke 19 and verse 10 that the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost, that is not a new concept. God did that from the very beginning. Have you not read Genesis chapter 3? They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the cool of the garden in the day. You know why? Because God wants us to come back. They had fallen. You think he still doesn't reach out to us? You think he hasn't done so even in all the times we're looking at, at Hosea, of Amos, of Joel, of all the others we're going to look at, and all the statements that he makes, and all the things that are said, and all the things that people say, oh, that's hard preaching. No, that's God's preaching. Return before it's ever too late. I, I've summed up the prophets many times as just to return or to come home. And that's what they are. Joel's preaching the same message here. I want you back, God says. I want you to come around. Joel is often called the prophet of Pentecost because of the passage there. And, well, it's quoted in Acts 2, 16 to 21. But we have it in chapter 2, 28 to 32. Now, here's a point that Joel is making. Looking at the devastation, looking at things, he just told them, look, I need you to repent. I need you to come back. You need to rend your heart. You need to make sure you're right with me. But here's what's going to happen. It shall come to pass in the last days. Now listen, when he's talking about the last days, he's not looking at some, some people say that's still future. But Peter quotes it in Acts chapter 2, this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days. That, young men dream dreams, and see visions, all these things are going on, the moon turned into darkness, all these things are going to happen. But he says, when he says this is that, you know what took place, what began in Acts chapter 2? The last days days that's when it began the church age is what he's talking about now folks the Bible is its own best commentary not the blockbuster on the Christian bookstore unless it happens to be the Bible right it teaches us what it's about it teaches us what Joel was looking forward to and he's giving these people hope and there's a reason why we look into the Old Testament and research and study these books as well because we're seeing God's plot plan for us. I told you his arms are always wide open, aren't they? They were even wide open for us. Nearly 800 years before Jesus was born, they were wide open for us. Making a way through the church of the blood of Jesus Christ that we could find salvation. And when you look back at the times that he's going on and looking ahead of the kingdom as he's doing, he's giving a promise of salvation. But folks, listen, the folks of that day could see the things and here's what I need to understand is they're looking forward or looking out really for the future generations how about that they look ahead for the people that are coming along behind them maybe the folks that aren't even born yet that we've got to straighten up and fly right because what about the people behind us and what about an application of that how do we live what do we do within the church are we keeping the church strong vibrant sound in the faith that those follow us are going to see the same thing or are we just stingy just for ourselves and that's good enough the former rather than the latter I hope looking out after all the kids are the future of the church I say they're the now of the church too let's not forget the now we can look so far in the future we forget the here and now sometimes that's what Joel's message part of it is it's looking ahead Looking to what's going on. Looking into the present. Look at what's happening. And he says, now is the time we need to turn around. Now is the time we need to make things right. Now is the time to do the things that God wants us to do. And if I think about these three passages just for a moment. 
and make some more application from this. I think there's great application from any book of the Old Testament and quite a bit here as well. I think of these three things, preparation, observation, and concentration. Preparation, number one, when Paul was writing to the Thessalonians, they had been spoken to in person and also seems like some letters going to chapter 2 had been written in the name of apostles teaching false doctrine same thing that people still like to do today Amen. try to change up what God has said but he says you yourselves know perfectly that is we have complete knowledge that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night People in that day said, I know exactly when it's coming. We've had people do that prognosticate for the last, I don't know, 50 years or so in this country, haven't we? You ever seen any of their publications? Oh, I know when it's coming. I've done all the math on it. The Bible is not a book of math. The Bible is a book of God. The souls of human beings and that heavenly realm. I don't want to start and do my calculations reading the Bible. I want to look as he says in this very passage, to be ready always. A thief in the night means just that. I have no idea. But there's a preparation that Joel is taught, reaching out to for their generation and generations to come. And folks, when we look at the passages found in Joel, look at the passages found in the Bible, that is a key element of godly living. That I live, listen, every day to what God says. That I live every day in preparation. Now we've heard for years, preachers have said it for years, we're not promised tomorrow, well, amen. We're not promised lunch. But we're promised far greater than lunch. We're far, promised far greater than tomorrow. We're promised heaven. We're promised eternity at the feet of the great I Am, at the feet of our Creator. And worship for the rest of our lives. I always tell people, if you don't like much about worship now, then you're sure not going to like heaven. That's what I read in the Bible. That's all it's about. I don't want to come to worship now, folks. I'm in trouble. Matter of fact, we won't make it if I understand the Bible right, if I don't like to worship God now. In our bodies, and our spirit, come in here. I have a preparation to do, folks. There's an observation that's taking place here. I think about Jesus there in John 9, dealing with several issues. But one was, he said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. For the night comes when no man can work. There's something I'm doing now. I'm observing the things around me. I'm doing the things I need to do. And I'm stepping out and doing it. When you look at Judah and, our, and, and Joel we're looking at today, when you look at Judah and the things they were and were not doing, they weren't realizing that the day was here. It was all like, well, we've got time. We'll just wait. Well, if things get around to it, if we get through with this and do these things over here, then we'll get to it. I mean, after all, we've got to replant our crops now, right? Well, yeah, you do. But does that mean that I can't also do the work of the Lord? How many times we fail to observe the things going on around us? Well, I couldn't do this. Couldn't take care of this work for the church. I couldn't do this work for the church over here because of just fill in a blank. How many times has that come up in our lives? That something else has come up first. Something else has taken us away from God. That something else, just as Judah is looking at, well, we've got crops to plant. Wait till we get to Haggai. They had a wall to build. What are we going to do? I read one time, and it's a really good book. It's called Matthew. And when you get to chapter 6, and the next to last verse in that chapter, in that book, it says, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Now listen to what he says. And all these things will be added unto you. If I go back to verse 24, you know what I find? Food, water, shelter, company, clothing, housing, all of our necessities. I'm telling you, it's a good book. You ought to read it. And we see in there that God takes care of us. Just as the lilies of the field, He takes care of us. And when I look at Israel, or Judah in Joel's day, uh, all those centuries ago, millennia ago, nearly three millennia ago, when I look at those times, it's almost folks didn't realize that. And God's taken care of His own since day one, literally. He's taken care of us. So there's a preparation, there's an observation, but folks, listen, there is a concentration 
that we have to have. Paul writing to the Colossians and all the heresies and all the angel worship and will worship and all those things that were going on when he begins chapter 3 after denouncing all of those things and festivals and new moons and such when he gets into chapter 3 he commands them and makes them to stop and look just for a moment that we should set our mind on things above not on things down here because we're risen with Christ that's all you need to know well, why, why, why? You're risen with Christ. Well, why? Because you're risen with Christ. That means you're a Christian. That means we're brand new inside. That means we're born again. That means we're born anew. But we set our mind, folks, listen, that, that seat of our intellect, of our thoughts, of our hopes, and of our dreams, we pound our chest and, be, and talk about our heart all too often. We're talking about here, he makes it clear, the mind. If my mind's set on Jesus, what's going to distract me? What should distract me, maybe I should say? Nothing, right? If I'm looking to Jesus, Paul, or the writer said, Hebrews writer said in Hebrews chapter 12, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised and shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God. If I look to that person, Folks, that's a goal. That's something that I can attain. That's that cross, that crown of life, James calls it. That's all those things that I can get because I'm looking ahead and I'm preparing myself. And I'm observing. And I'm understanding everything about the life in front of me and then what God wants me to have. But he doesn't say he's just going to hand it to us on a silver platter. He didn't say it to Israel, to Judah, to the Hebrews coming out of captivity, or to Adam and Eve. You know, Adam still had to work and sweat to tend the, or had to work to tend the garden, didn't he? You know, I think we forget that sometimes. Well, he was in the Garden of Eden. He just sat back with his tea and lemonade and had a great time. Read your Bible again. Before the fall, he was working. God doesn't just hand anything without working for it. He's always planning that we work for it. You know what happens when you don't work for something? Read the Old Testament. Read how it was when they came into the land of Canaan. God warned them back in Deuteronomy. You're going to have vineyards that you didn't plant, but you're going to take from them. You're going to have houses that you didn't build. You're going to have all these things. Then you're going to fall away. Folks, when I work for it, when I look as the people in Joel's day were told to do, look to God that I could rend my heart, that I pay attention to my heart, make sure it's focused on God. I've got a focus in front of me. I've got my, Paul said, an eye on the prize. And you know what happens? You ever seen somebody that's running a race? Sprint, sprint or a marathon. And when they look out and they see that, that focus on that ribbon down there, nothing is going to stop them. I've seen people hobble, be dragged, kick, roll, whatever they to finish that because they've worked too hard at the race I'm not going to stop now can't we do the same in our race in life can't we quit looking around at all the things that are going to trip us up because they're going to happen looking at pitfalls they're going to be there looking at obstacles welcome to life how bad do we want to cross the finish line church no matter what no matter what Listen, if you're here and you're not a child of God, God pleads from beginning to end of the Bible that people come to Him. He doesn't say just come to me and that's it, but He tells us why. Come to me that you might have, as Jesus says often, everlasting life. Come to me, as God says throughout the Old Testament as well, that you might have life. That you not only have life, but you have a better life. Jesus came to give us that. But that we can understand those things by understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ. How he died, how he was buried, how he rose again on the third day. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul makes it very clear. And when we do those things, and according to Romans chapter 6, we reenact it through the act of baptism because that's what God said. No other reasons needed. And we're buried with him in baptism. We are raised to walk in newness of life. And the goal, the prize, is closer, but it's not here yet. But we run, we walk, we crawl. And if i got to drag you, I'm more than willing to help. 
But let's get there. Let's get there together. Maybe you have. Maybe you've fallen away. Folks, listen. Don't stay outside of God's realm. If I sin, the Bible says it separates me from God. I live in that sin. I'm separated. And that is a state we don't want to be in. Now, we're in the hereafter. If anyone has need today, why don't you come while we stand and while we sing?